Hello, my name is Carlos Pasquale, Senior Vice President for Global Energy and International Affairs at IHS Market. It's a pleasure to welcome you back to the CIRA Week conversation series. It's an opportunity for us to have these exclusive art conversations with thought leaders in energy, people in industry, government, finance, academia, who are shaping the world way the energy world looks in the midst of the COVID pandemic, in the midst of an energy transition. Today, we have an opportunity to focus on Nigeria and the way that energy is a hedge against the virus and part of the stimulus that will bring Nigeria's economy back. And for this conversation, we have the opportunity to have with us Mele Kiari, the Managing Director of Nigeria's National Petroleum Company. Mele, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for joining today. Thank you very much, Carlos. Good to speak to you today. So today, Mele and I would like to take you through a journey that travels through the context for Nigeria, for what's happened in the world globally over the past week. And from there, we'll come back to Nigeria's situation, the operational issues confronting NNPC, some of the challenges that are facing the government. And we want to close with a statement that Mele wants to offer us about transparency. But Mele, begin with the context, help our listeners understand what is the context of COVID in Nigeria today? Yes, to us uh, as a country, it means a lot because we are a very resource dependent country. And not only that, oil and gas accounts for 90% of government revenue. So anything that impacts on government revenue, uh, particularly on petroleum, is a huge issue for our country. But of course, uh, uh, the COVID also throws other challenges at us. That is so the, the health situation of the country, the reaction that uh, we, we met in, as a result of this COVID situation. And the combination of all this is a huge fiscal challenge for our country uh, in an intervention that is unavoidable to make sure that we contain the pandemic's impact on our country. And overall, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a massive rebalancing that the industry has to do to respond to this situation. So for us, as the national oil company, we are at the center of it all. We guarantee government's revenue. Uh, we manage the government assets on behalf of the state. And, and therefore, any adjustment that we make in terms of uh, balancing our expectations, balancing our project has a direct impact on the entire federation. So for us, uh, COVID is a huge challenge, but it also throws some uh, opportunities at us. Mele, you've talked about how you've been at the center of it all in Nigeria, but you were also at the center of, the, of it all in the past week. Nigeria is a member of OPEC. Your country was involved in the negotiations that took place virtually as part of the OPEC Club Plus group and with the G20. Can you share with us some of your observations where you were participating as Nigeria's national representative to OPEC? Yes, the conference participation is structured in such a way that the Minister of State for Petroleum is, is the spokesperson for our country. Uh, but I have also the privilege of being the Nigerian National Rep. That means that I was party to the meeting, even though I did not make direct contributions. Of course, our inputs are taken on board in responding to, uh, to the OPEC Plus uh, engagements. What I saw is uh, it's a dire situation, uh, an extremely desperate situation for the whole OPEC Plus and the partners, including those partners who are not necessarily on the table during those engagements. It was very clear and obvious that we have a huge uh, a stockpile of uh, petroleum across the world. Storages are getting filled up. As a matter of fact, we all understand uh, and during the meeting that uh, if we don't do anything, uh, by the end of May, there will be no storage anywhere to put petroleum and therefore it could almost lead to a total crash of the entire oil and gas industry. That is very clear and obvious to all and taking an action is very obvious. Uh, irrespective of who participates or who doesn't, you know, we almost ultimately know that we'll end up with a situation of a cut. So a cutting the cut for 10 million barrels from the OPEC plus partners is a natural thing to do. It is unavoidable. And, and the conversations were in such a way that when do we get this done, who do we get signed up as quickly as is possible so that we can take the next step. And this was my perception, and we are completely aligned with that. We know that we are doing things to ramp up our production. We have opportunities to, to, to bring our production to a level that it never happened. As a matter of fact, a week ago, we were able to get to a level that we never did in three years to come. But we also know that you can't continue producing if you can't dispose it. Uh, we know that you, know, you have to come back from this position to take out the stock so that you can benefit from the the revenues that will come from this. So for us, it is a tough decision, 
but we know it is unavoidable because we also know that if nothing is done, we could end up with uh, 3 million barrels that you cannot take to the market. So that's what I saw. And of course, I also saw the, the need to bring everybody on the tech, uh, including countries which are traditionally constrained by antitrust uh, considerations to see the sense in why production has to go down, uh, even if it means uh, some form of curtailment of uh, exports. And this seems to be working. That there's nothing on the table to indicate that, but we also know that contribution from non-participants to that platform uh, will make up for the extreme stock that we have, and we we'll probably take them out by by end of June. Was it a surprise to see the United States around the table with, um, of the G20? Yes, absolutely, because it's unavoidable. As we are aware, uh, many of the players in the industry have American uh, origin, particularly the major oil companies, and particularly there are companies that are that will be impacted, particularly companies that produce the shale oil in, in the United States. Extremely low prices will, will mean practically shutting down this asset. And therefore, whether there's, uh, if there are no agreements, you know, there's a natural cut in this uh, uh, supply source uh, coming from the United States. So definitely the United States is an interested party in this without really getting into any agreement on court. But it is obvious that uh, this situation has thrown off a challenge that will make those producers to cut productions. And on the basis of a very sheer informed self-interest, and the United States needs to know what is happening, needs to encourage and facilitate this process, even if they don't participate uh, directly. And the outcome of it is that uh, uh, when this stock is uh, brought down, everybody will benefit, including the United States-based companies. Now, let's bring this inevitability back to Nigeria and the actions that you're taking at the Nigerian National Petroleum Company. Um, share with us the, the steps and the measures you're taking on your expenditures, your relationships with your partners. Yes, our partners uh, are very important to us. We have developed a relationship that will put all the cards on the table so that we collaborate so that we can make the best uh, decision that is in the best interest of all the businesses. Our partners in the last uh, eight to nine months have been engaged you know, deeply and we are now completely uh, operating as a single, uh, single house. And that has given us the opportunity to create a business continuity plan, which brings into context the views of our partners and what we think should happen. And on the basis of that, we agreed that certain things that we need to do to continue to run the business in a way that is beneficial to all of us. And, and secondly, but most importantly, to, for the companies and our partners to see this as an opportunity for greater collaboration. And the result of that is to see a, a future where even if we have to take part in production, we have to rebalance our projects, uh, shifting forward our project to new debts. You know, it's essentially coming out of a collaborative area. It's not an enforcement. It is uh, something that we need to do together. And the end result of this is to see a rebound of oil prices, which all of us will benefit from, and also to enable government to uh, readjust its uh, expectations from the oil and gas while maintaining certain basic expectations. And we think that uh, this uh, curtailment uh, that has happened will, will amount to probably a rebound of about $15 to the barrel. And if that happens, and with the scaling down of the expectations of the production level, uh, which by consensus, uh, it means that we can still do many things that, that the government plans to do in this fiscal year. Interesting. One of the things that you really underscore is that this has to be an effort of many companies and those companies operating across the world, tying together the interests that you have in Nigeria with the interests that companies may have in other parts of the world because they're interconnected. And when you're taking that point and, what, and your comment about price, could you share with us, if it's not a problem, what your price outlook is for the rest of the year? Yes, our price outlook is average of $30 to the barrel for the year at budget level. But we know that bringing into effect this curtailment that we have all agreed to will probably rebound it back by another $15, which can bring us uh, to nearly uh, $50 to the barrel as an average for the year. Uh, that would mean that companies can make certain decisions, uh, some production, some asset can produce at uh, that low levels lower than that, and therefore this will enable going forward of many projects that would have ordinarily uh, been uh, scaled down if uh, the price level remains below the 30. So in terms of uh, managing portfolios, every company will look at the uh, what next to do. And, and our intention is to see how we can uh, sustain many of the projects that are on, on the table 
and, and possibly also take new FIDs uh, in the light of the adjustment that this uh, situation will bring. Uh, for us, we see it as an opportunity. Uh, our partners are aligned on this and will now engage next week uh, probably to to see so what's the next step that we need to take. Uh, bear in mind that you know we're all expecting some form of rebound in prices. Indeed, an important observation that even though you have these targets, you also have to look at how you optimize within what the market provides you in terms of that price environment. Tell us, Mele, about your workers and what you're doing to keep them safe. Yes, when we saw this uh, challenge thrown by COVID-19 and the need to lock down to ensure that our workers are safe and healthy, and also to see our country participating in the overall global response to this, you know, the first thing we did is to design a business continuity plan, uh, which means that people can work from home, maintain basic, uh, basic services in the offices, and of course, uh, continue to operate our uh, field assets uh, without disruption. So far, this has worked. Uh, we haven't seen any disruption to our work. As, as a matter of fact, our production actually rose within this period, and which means that some efficiency is introduced by everyone uh, working online. So uh, for us, uh, we have done a number of things to, to make this uh, work to our advantage. And, um, and our workers are at home. We, they're still at home. We still have an extension of two weeks uh, to the lockdown in some, some cities and across the country. Uh, we took several measures to safeguard their, their, their health. For instance, giving them all the PPPs that they require uh, to make sure that all basic medical tests are conducted before they go to work. And then we make sure we limit the access of others to them uh, without industry screening. So overall, we don't have uh, much incidences uh, um, that is relating to, uh, to the oil and gas industry today. And another thing that the protocols and the procedures in the oil and gas industry, which always put the workers face, has safeguarded us from doing that. So we, we're doing well. And with the offshore platforms, uh, it's a tight space, a tough environment. How are you managing that? Yeah, the first thing is to screen the workers before they go to the, to the location. Uh, which is what we did to make sure that they have some level of uh, we have some level of comfort that these people are not infected and there are very many medical ways of doing this conducting the tests on the individual workers taking their temperatures and giving them all the necessary ppes as they bought those platform and we also did something which is to scale down the number of people on those platform and nearly by 50 percent in all the assets and the combination of all these that we still don't have any reported incidents except one of uh, of anyone on the facilities have been infected by the COVID-19 virus. And, and indeed, one of the things that NNPC, together with the industry, that what you've done is you've helped set up a fund um, to address aspects of, the, of this crisis. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, we are the industry that is operating within communities. And the health and safety of these communities is very important to our business. The COVID-19, obviously, has impact on communities. And as a first step, uh, and as, a, as an industry, we know that if these, com these communities are not safe, we can't continue to operate on the basis of informed business interest that we know that we need to step forward and do something. And we're also operating in a larger context of a country, uh, which is uh, obviously not shielded from the impact of uh, COVID-19. And combination of these two interests uh, put us forward to say, what can we do to support this country in this time of need? And we brought all our partners on the table, upstream, downstream, and the midstream to see how our material support can we give to this country. And as a result of those engagement, we're able to have about $60 million of combined uh, contributions so that we can now bring in materials, uh, kits, uh, build infrastructure, provide you know, logistic materials to the whole of, whole of the country, and particularly focus on our operational areas. And of course, uh, we're an industry that is structured around processes and procedures, so we cannot donate cash. And what we did is to quantify the help that all of us can do in terms of material and allow the internal procurement process of these companies to deliver on those uh, promises. And it's working. Many have started delivering on this. So we're aligning this with the overall federal government's plan to, to bring help and support to, uh, to the communities. And, and so far, it is working. And we're very confident that this help will be of material value to the country. That engagement with Foresight in LA seems to be really critical. And one of the things we've seen in the past are challenges in the Niger Delta that you've confronted. Today, is security a challenge or an issue for you in the Niger Delta? It is a challenge. It's no longer an extreme challenge. Uh, we have done many things to create some intervention to bring down the incidences of uh, bundles attacking our facilities. 
and also people taking advantage of the loose security situation to drop things in, in the environment. And you can see that work out in terms of the sustainability of our production profile. Uh, we haven't seen massive uh, fall in our, our production. The incidences of force major in some of our assets have come down significantly. And overall, when we see averages of production well below above what we know three years ago to two years ago, it's an indication that these uh, security interventions are working. Yes, there are some incidences, but it is no longer of a massive concern. There are still ongoing interventions, but in terms of community engagement and in terms of fiscal intervention by the state to make sure that those incidences come to know. Issue of security in the Niger Delta uh, is, yes, it's a concern, but uh, it's no longer a huge matter for us to deal with. Um, you raised earlier the significance of energy for Nigeria, its importance for foreign exchange reserves internally within the country. Um, one of the things that Nigeria has struggled with for years is to set the right fiscal terms, the right policy guidance from the center. Yesterday when we spoke, you mentioned to me steps, extraordinary steps that you're seeking to take. Can you share those with us? Yes, you know, we tried to adjust our fiscal environment in the last 20 years, we were unable to deliver on this, but today we have a structure that will deliver on that properly by end of July. What that will do is to recognize the global fiscal environment. Companies have choice. Today you have oil produced from the unexpected of places. You can find almost oil almost nearly everywhere if you can say that. Uh, what that means is if countries would like, would like to see investment in, in their territories, they must make a competitive uh, fiscal environment. And what we're doing now is to recognize this situation and also come up with a fiscal environment that will be competitive, that will be different from what we have today so that we can keep our current investors and attract new investors into our, our environment. And this is simply a matter of uh, managing our taxation, managing our royalty rates, cost recovery uh, processes, and which the law will recognize all this. And by, by the time we're done with that, you know, now you'll see massive investment coming into our country, particularly at the first level. And of course, we're also going to improve on the governance issues. Uh, there are too many institutions in managing uh, the oil and gas industry. This new law will make sure that uh, there's some alignment that, is, that will be achieved. So that the streamlining of processes are put in place so that we become a very modern oil and gas industry, which uh, as you may be aware, the structure we're running today has been there since 1969. And we know that modernity has come. A uh, number of things, uh, technology has come into play. People have choices that they didn't have 10 years ago. And if you are respond to this, you know, you're going to lose out uh, overall. And the uh, indications that we're having from our partners, because we do engage them, even as this process of legislating is going on, is to make sure that it's an industry solution is put on the table that will recognize all uh, parties' uh, views. Uh, we're very confident that uh, our structure will change, uh, the fiscal environment will change, and ultimately this country will be the destination for investment. So one of the things you mentioned was the petroleum industry governance bill and the broader fiscal uh, policy framework. You see legislation on that being proposed, potentially even being passed by the middle of the summer? Absolutely. Our target was to deliver that by the end of July latest, but unfortunately, the COVID-19 has uh, created some uh, uh, some challenges of uh, scheduling. Uh, yes, the work is going on, but of course, you know, in, in lawmaking, there are fiscal contests that you can avoid, and we know that the COVID-19 uh, lockdown will impact on our scheduling, but we're doing everything possible to recover those schedule and still deliver by the end of July. Uh, worst case scenario will do surely have a new legal framework within the year. That would be outstanding. I'm sure you're, all of your partners would look at that with great interest and it would have a massive impact on the way that they see Nigerian investments in the future. Um, just one more question on, on the near term and concerning your supply chains and the ability of businesses, small businesses throughout Nigeria that are part of that domestic supply chain and their ability to function. Are the fiscal measures that are being taken strong enough? Will they have the ability to survive this crisis? Yes, they will, because our legislation will recognize uh, the capacity of uh, individual players to cover their costs and make margin out of it. And of course, you know, small players will require more flexibility, more incentives to produce. Well, you can manage uh, 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 different expectations from large scale uh, producers. So the law will recognize those situations and respond to it adequately because we will be rewarding production uh, in the new law, uh, which means that if you produce less, uh, you probably have uh, 
uh, some balance of uh, uh, costs that will, uh, will deliver on your uh, on your obligations and also on the benefits that you will make. So uh, to recognize those situations, the small players will be recognized, and of course also the large players will have the space that they deserve. Uh, the other implication of uh, getting this fiscal framework sorted out is having an environment that will work for the midstream and the downstream. Uh, there is currently uh, a decision to proceed with the regulated uh, pricing mechanism for all the uh, uh, white products. Uh, uh, all have been deregulated except the premium metals, motor spirit, which we did uh, two weeks ago. And that will also be reinforced by the new legislation. We'll recognize it, but we do not need a new regulation to get into that. And we're proceeding with that. And of course, we also focus on the midstream such that our ac access in the midstream, particularly gas processing assets, have been necessary legal framework that will support more uh, development in the midstream asset. And we are looking for what we look forward is to have uh, a midstream that will support gas into industry, gas to power, uh, such a way that our country can take advantage of the huge gas resources that we have on ground. So the law is looking at end to end. Uh, yes, we'll maintain production, increase production, make the money from it, but more importantly, we'll enhance uh, actions and activities in the midstream uh, such that you know we can have enough power, enough uh, combustion of uh, uh, gas into materials and, and so on. So uh, we have high expectations, but this is the right time to do this, and the expectations are not really out of place. To close out this picture, Mally, tell us a little bit about some about the trans transparency measures that you're taking at NNPC. Yes, we recognize a huge concern. Uh, of course, they are historical. Uh, Maybe we're not communicated enough, but the fact is that everybody thinks uh, uh, NNPC and Nigerian oil and gas industry has a, uh, in a wide scale as a very opaque uh, situation. We are not transparent, we are not uh, uh, accountable. Uh, but that story has changed. We know today that uh, we're the only company in the whole world that will uh, publish its uh, monthly performance and financial report. Nobody does this anywhere in the world, and we know this is a very significant step. And beyond this, NNPC as a company decided to become a partner company for the global EITA. What that means is that you know, you, this company will have to disclose its processes, its procedures. Uh, it has to disclose everything it's doing to all its stakeholders, particularly its shareholders. And uh, the other thing you may uh, wish to note is that uh, we are the only company, national oil company, that uh, signing for this, except one that is in process. And of all the multinational oil companies that you are aware of, only two companies sign up to this because that throws extreme responsibility of transparency and accountability to, to companies that participate in this. The combination of these two is that we are a very different company. We are a company for the future so that this will enable us to have ability to go outside our shores to do business, to become a global company that people can trust and shareholders can trust. Right? This is our ambition and we have gone very deep into this. And we're very, very proud as a company that we're doing this. Mel Carey, thank you so much for the description that you've given us of the new company that you're trying to build in NNPC. And indeed, you've given us a really unique insight. You've talked about the inevitability of cuts that had to be taken and drove administrative action. But at the same time, you've said that it's fundamental to look at the marketplace and how to optimize those cuts. And indeed, the market never separates itself from our energy world. It's something that we have to keep coming back to and understand the technological and the commercial decisions that you're taking right now in NNPC. We thank you for these insights. Thank you for being such a good partner to us at Sierra Week. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you. Thank you very much, Carlos. I deeply appreciate this opportunity to speak to all of you and to the industry. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.